Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Franz Kafka's story, typically translated as the metamorphosis in German, uh, Die Verwandlung, has a beginning line that many people have argued over and proposed alternate translations of. And since it's been so controversial, we should probably talk about that at the very beginning. So, you know, this translation that we have right here begins in a fairly typical way, but making a deliberative choice in specifying. As Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself, and here's the key part, transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect. And the German is zu einem ungeheuren ungeziefer. So it doesn't say insect. That's a possible rendering of this. And then verwandelt, the verwandlung is transformation or metamorphosis, a change from one thing into another. And if we look at a number of different translations, we see, you know, gigantic, monstrous, vile, horrible, sometimes with these uh, connected up with each other. So translating ungeheuren, right? Something that has a nastiness about it, right? And then well, what is the noun here? So ungeziefer, as, as some people will, you know, go on to tell you, um, this is, you know, in, in older German, an animal not fit for sacrifice. But by the time that Kafka is writing, it's a colloquialism. It means some sort of gross thing. So insect works, vermin, you know, all the kinds of things you don't want around you, pest or bug. And then sometimes it gets a little bit more specific. Um, cockroach, bed bug, why would you use those to render this? Uh, it's not saying that it's that kind of bug, but those are insects, bugs, arthropods that evoke a sort of reaction on our part. And so this is something that uh, Gregor Samsa, the character himself, has the opportunity to be disgusted at, and then everybody else around him. As we're going to see, you know, his, his parents, his sister, the family unit, they still see him as him until close to the end, but they're repulsed by him. And then other people, the clerk who comes to check, the lodgers, the uh, maid, they all get freaked out as well. The only person who doesn't have any problem with it is the charwoman, who is an interesting character who we'll discuss in, in, in another place. So what do we have going on? He's transformed into a giant insect, a bug, whatever you want to call him. And there's an initial description of this. He was lying on his hard, as it were, armor-plated back. And when he lifted his head a little, he could see his dome-like brown belly divided into stiff arch segments on top of which the bed quilt could hardly keep in position and was about to slide off completely. So big old, you know, bug body. His numerous legs, which were pitifully thin compared to the rest of his bulk, waved helplessly before his eyes. And, you know, immediately instead of realizing the problem that he's in, he starts thinking about work and stuff like that. And what we're going to see him talking about is you know, trying to get out of bed and the legs not cooperating. And um, here we read, his immediate intention was to get up quietly without being disturbed, 
put on his clothes and above all eat his breakfast and then consider what else was to be done. So he's not, it hasn't really sunk in yet. To get rid of the quilt was easy. He had only to inflate himself a little, it fell off. But the next move was difficult, especially because he was so uncommonly broad, he would have needed arms and hands to hoist himself up. Instead, he had only the numerous little legs, which never stopped waving in all directions and which he could not control in the least. When he tried to bend one of them, it was the first to stretch itself straight. When he succeeded at last in making it do what he wanted, all the other legs waved the more wildly in a high degree of unpleasant agitation, right? So, you know, things are not going great for this new body. And he does manage to get himself out of bed uh, after some efforts, right? And what we see happening is the change is not just, as it is so often in cartoons, you just like different mind or same mind and a different body and somebody's uh, a bug and they do just fine. This is thinking, well, what would it be like to have your mind, your consciousness in a body that you're very unfamiliar with? So what we're going to see is a change in some of his capacities and his voice is a prime example of this. We see that at first, his voice is still relatively human, human-like at least. But then it starts to change. And he's, you know, he's talking uh, to, the, to the clerk. And um, here we go. Um, Did you understand a word of it? The chief clerk was asking. Surely he can't be trying to make fools of us. Oh dear, cried his mother in tears. Perhaps he's terribly ill and we're tormenting him. And so nobody can understand him at this point. And Gregor realizes this. The words he uttered were no longer understandable, apparently, though they seem clear enough to him, even clearer than before because his ear had grown accustomed to the sound of them. Yet at any rate, people now believe something was wrong with him and they are ready to help him. So, He's losing the ability to communicate with them. And we see a transformation that's going to happen of senses. This is the first one has to do with hearing. Um, Smell, taste are going to change as well. But if we move ahead, we will see that his sight starts to become dimmer as well. And he, we, we realize this because he likes to hang out at the window where he he looks out and we find out that um, what used to be an enjoyable thing for him is now going to become uh, looking out into a gray void, right? But let's talk about um, his other capacities. So movement is going to be, uh, you know, a critical matter. Can he actually get around, we see that um, he is able to get out of bed, right? And that is going to be um, quite important, but he can't do much of anything until he gets those legs on the floor. So the chief clerk is about to leave. Gregor manages to get out of there And we see that uh, once he reaches the ground, his little legs start, you know, running and he can actually make some some headway. Um, So he's got movement, uh, but he can't use tools anymore. The key presents him with a problem. He has to turn it with his mouth. And he's like, oh, if I had some teeth, this would be really easy. Instead, I've got these mandibles that I have to use. So, you know, very interesting reflections woven into this story about what is actually happening with his, his body. And we're going to see that um, he's going to start hiding under a sofa and, um, you know, going into different places. But even more important, Change in taste. What is it that he wants to eat? So Greta originally brings him, uh, you know, a bowl of milk. 
And why? Because um, that's what he used to like before. So uh, there stood a basin drawn with fresh milk in which floated little sops of white bread. He could have almost laughed with joy since he was now still hungrier than in the morning. He dipped his head almost over the eyes straight into the milk, but in disappointment. He withdrew it again. Not only did he find it difficult to feed because of his left side, he did not like the milk either, although milk had been his favorite drink, and that was certainly why his sister had set it there for him. Indeed, it was almost with revulsion he turned away from the basin. So it's not just that he doesn't enjoy what he used to enjoy. He's revolted by it. And his sister engages in some experiment, right? She sees that the milk hasn't been drunk, so she's actually going to bring him food. There were old half-decayed vegetables, bones from last night's suffer, covered, covered with white sauce that had thickened, some raisins and almonds, a piece of cheese. Gregor would have called uneatable two days ago a dry roll of bread, a buttered roll, and a roll both buttered and salted. Beside that, she sat down in the same basin into which she'd poured some water, and which was apparently to be reserved for his exclusive use. So he finds, you know, here we go, one after another, and with tears of satisfaction, he quickly devoured the cheese, gross cheese that he wouldn't have eaten, vegetables, rotten vegetables, the sauce, leftover sauce. The, the fresh food, on the other hand, had no charms for him. He could not even stand the smell of it and actually dragged away to some little distance the things that he could eat. So his taste is changing as is what he enjoys doing. Uh, we're going to find that, um, here we go, often he'd lay there during the long nights without sleeping, scrabbling for hours on the leather of the sofa, or he nerved himself to the great effort of pushing an armchair to the window. This is that sight thing that we're talking about. In, in reality, day by day, things that were even a little way off are growing dimmer in his sight. Um, he says he, would, he might have believed his window gave on a desert waste where gray sky and gray land blended indistinguishably into each other. But he still goes to that because it's sort of a symbol of freedom. What else does he enjoy? Well, he likes uh, running around in the place, but running around in the way that a bug does, no longer a human. Um, and here we go. Uh, he was losing any interest he had ever taken in food. For mere recreation, he'd formed the habit of crawling crisscross over the walls and ceiling. He especially enjoyed hanging suspended from the ceiling. It was much better than lying on the floor. One could breathe more freely. One's body swung and rocked lightly. And in the almost blissful absorption induced by this suspension, it could happen to his own surprise. He let go and fell plump onto the floor. Yet now he had his body much better under control than formerly, and even such a big fall did him no harm. He's also leaving traces of goop where he's crawling around all over the walls and things like that. So his enjoyments are changing significantly. And now we get to a kind of crisis that takes place. Gregor is still to some degree, a human being. And um, there's this proposal by Greta, who's now sort of stepped up, they should take all the stuff out of his room. Let him crawl around all he wants. Clearly that's what he's into. And his mother says, doesn't it look as if we are showing him by taking away his furniture We've given up hope of his ever getting better and we're just leaving him to himself. I think it would be best to keep his room exactly as it's been so that when he comes back to us, he will find everything unchanged and be all the more easily to forget what has happened in between. And then we have this crisis. On hearing these words from his mother, Gregor realized the lack of all direct human speech for the past two months together with the monotony of family life must have confused his mind. Otherwise, he could not account for the fact he had quite earnestly looked forward to having his room emptied of furnishing. Did he really want his warm room so comfortably fitted with old family furniture to be turned into a naked den in which he would certainly be able to crawl unhampered in all directions? 
but at the price of shedding simultaneously all recollection of his human background. He had indeed been so near the brink of forgetfulness that only the voice of his mother, which he had not heard for so long, had drawn him back from it. And he resolves nothing should be taken from his room. So he's trying to hold on to a humanity that he realizes, I was about to lose. I had forgotten. And what are the components of this? Lack of human speaking, monotony. The transformation is an ongoing thing. It's not that he just turned into a bug at the start and then became a bug. He is becoming bug as time is going on. And he's trying to resist that. We see a little bit later another fascinating uh, passage where uh, we see Gregor hardly slept at night or by day. He was often haunted by the idea that next time the door opened, he would take the family's affairs in hand just as he used to. Once more, after this long interval, there appeared in his thoughts the figures of the chief and chief clerk, commercial travelers, going on and on and on. And he thinks that, you know, things would begin again. At other times, he would not be in the mood to bother about his family. He was only filled with rage. Rage over what? At the way they were neglecting him. Though he had no clear idea what he might care to eat, he would make plans for getting into the larder to take the food that was, after all, his due, even if he were not hungry. So in certain ways, he's becoming, in his view, more more animalistic, right? And then there's this other passage, very suggestive, right? And one that we have to think about the implications. And this leads to an actual crisis within the family, So his sister is playing violin. The lodgers are listening to her. Apparently, sure, she's not playing to their satisfaction. And maybe she's not really that that good. And so there's two important things that are happening here about Gregor. We find that Gregor um, is covered with all sorts of stuff. Um, He had more reason than ever to hide himself since owing to the amount of dust that lay thick in his room and rose into the air at the slightest movement, He too was covered with dust, fluff, and hair, and remnants of food trailed with him, caught on his back, along his sides. His indifference to everything was much too great for him to turn on his back and scrape himself clean on the carpet, as once he had done several times a day, and in spite of his condition, no shame, deterred him from advancing a little over the spotless floor of the living room. So there's another transformation that's taken place here, a lack of attentiveness to bodily condition, Gregor uh, doesn't have the same concern over his appearance that he had earlier or pride in his appearance. But his sister's playing and he starts creeping out into the living room. So um, Gregor's sister, according to him, was playing so beautifully, right? And uh, Gregor crawled a little forward so it might be possible for his eyes to meet hers. And then he says, Was he an animal that music had such an effect on him? He felt as if the the way were opening before him to the unknown nourishment he craved. He was determined to push forward till he reached his sister to pull at her skirt and let her know she was to come into his room with her violin, for no one here appreciated her playing as he would appreciate it. And then we read, he would never let her out of his room, at least not so long as he lived. So he's going to imprison her. His frightful appearance would become, for the first time, useful to him. He would watch all the doors at his room and spit at intruders, but his sister should need no constraint. She should stay with him of her own free will. So he's got this captivity fantasy playing in his head. But the question, is he an animal that music has such an effect on him? There's not a lot of animals that music actually does have much of an effect on, is there, compared to us human beings? So it's kind of a weird thing for him to be saying. He's he's a, a humanized animal, we could say. There is actually a final transformation that we can talk about, and this is uh, signified by the charwoman coming to the family and saying, look at this, it's dead, it's lying there, done dead and done for. So they go in the room and Greta says, look how thin he was. 
It's such a long time since he's eaten anything. The food came out again just as it went in. Indeed, Gregor's body was completely flat and dry, as could only now be seen when it was no longer supported by the legs, and nothing prevented one from looking closely at it. And we're going to see the charwoman is actually going to tell them... Um, there we go. You don't need to bother about how to get rid of the thing next door. It's been seen to already. Gregor has been reduced to a corpse, something to be completely gotten rid of, a burden that the family is now free of. So there's not just one single transformation that's taking place in this novel. There are a number of them, and we see that Gregor himself takes positions on his own transformation, to some degree at least, at certain points, trying to resist it or fantasizing about it not being the case. So we have a very complex idea being signified here with all, you know, built into this initial sentence that, you know, one morning awakening from dreams, Gregor finds himself transformed into however we're going to translate it, an ungeheuren, ungeziefer, you know, a monstrous insect, a bug, a cockroach, a pest, a vermin, whatever it's going to be, but remaining at least partly human through all of it, all the way to the end where he becomes merely a corpse to be disposed of.